Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the Real Foot National Wildlife Refuge. Thank you, Alexis. Welcome, everyone, to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our beautiful home, especially right now in the spring in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Alexis, have you been enjoying the spring? I have. I love the weather change. It's absolutely beautiful everywhere here in O'Brien County. Uh, Before I introduce today's very special guest that you helped us find, what is something you've discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? Um, Well, I was looking into some highlights for our Facebook. We've been highlighting exhibits, and I found out that the schoolhouse that we have was actually like stationed six miles from Discovery Park, Um, and it was at the O'Brien County Museum in 91, and then it came to Discovery Park in 2011. Well, that's very interesting. Um, it's interesting when they move these buildings around. Right. A lot of people, uh, you know, they are, there's a whole art to that and yeah. getting it from point A to point B with that completely destroying it. Certainly. Um, I can't even barely move a box <laughs> no. of things without everything being completely ruined. So thank you for that. And now we're going to have our very special guest, Lisa Smart, a motivational humorist and writer. Thank you, Scott. Glad to be with you guys. Lisa, tell me a little bit about your background. Where did you come from? Uh, what went into creating little tiny Lisa Smart? Yes, I well, a very a tall six foot eight man who was a basketball coach, and my poor little five eight wife. I mean, wife, his wife, my mom. But I was born in West Kentucky. Uh, both my parents were teachers at that time. My dad was a basketball coach, but because he had a temper, he got and he got too many technicals, and so he got out of coaching and went right into teaching only. They were awesome. But when I was twelve years old, we moved north to. North Texas and Denton, right north of Dallas, in order for them to be administrators at a children's home. So I spent my junior high and high school years growing up at a children's home. My parents were the directors, and I graduated high school there, and then I traveled all around in my early 20s and uh, got to see the world, did a lot of mission work, sometimes stayed for a year. I was kind of... um, I was kind of a hippie, but in the 80s, in the early 80s, instead of in the 60s and 70s, I did a lot of traveling. My parents were very supportive of it. I would take a semester or two off of school. And then when I married my husband, we lived in Nacogdoches, Texas. And then in College Station, Texas was the last place we lived before we moved here. And we moved here 19 years ago. And we live out in the country on a little country road. And we're just... Happy as a pig and slop. I, I I can um I can imagine um how how nice it is with the land you have and getting to live out live out in the woods. Um, so tell us a little bit. I'm curious about what it was like to be at the age you were when suddenly you're uprooted and your whole life is upside down now. All of a sudden, you're living in like a children's home. What was that? Right. Like? Yeah, I tell people all the time, don't ever move a girl when she's at the ugly stage. Are you kidding? I mean, it was the most amazing thing. When I was in eighth grade, it's like God was building a six foot woman, but he only had the first floor done. I was just all legs. I was so awkward and gangly. And to make things worse, everybody expected me to be a ball player. My dad had played ball for LSU a little bit, and then he'd played for some other schools. And and he was a great basketball coach. Well, other than the you know, the uncontrollable temper, which, uh, but he was, he was such a great ball player. Everybody just expected with me being so tall that I would be a great ball player, but I wasn't, I wasn't an academic. I was so awkward. And literally Scott, looking back on that move, we moved to this big metropolitan kind of school district where all the girls were so pretty and they all were from different kind of situation. All of those experiences actually built the career that I stand on now. I just got back from Wichita, Kansas last night. I have literally built, by God's grace, a career around the fact 
that I felt awkward, but so does everybody else. And in all kinds of situations, we're never always the smartest. There's always somebody smarter than us, prettier than us, more talented than us. But how do we come alongside people, care about them, build them up, encourage them? And had I been the best at everything always, that would have been a harder thing to come into. So yes, I was extremely awkward. 12 was a hard time to move me. My parents were busy at the children's home. Uh, We kind of, in some ways, kind of raised ourselves sometimes because those kids had so many needs. And um, that was a blessing because unlike parenting now, I was not the center of the universe for my parents. They loved me very much, but they felt like our whole family was on mission. And believe it or not, that was a blessing, too, because I learned that, you know, my belly button is not the center of the universe. And so I learned how to be about others. And and that's actually a good model to follow. And we taught that to our boys. Philip used to always say to them, now, look, your belly button is not the center of the universe. And that is another thing I learned from my parents being on mission. I was not the center of the world for them. And that was actually a good thing. Now, that might be a very controversial statement now, but it was a very good thing. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You and I have something in common. Halfway through my ninth grade year, um, living outside of Memphis, my parents moved us to Fort Worth, Texas, where my dad oh. started going to seminary. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, Southwest. Oh, my goodness. So right around, yes. and I went from a little tiny, you know, at the time it was a small private school, uh, Briarcrest, and then yeah. uh, started going to a big city school in Fort Worth. Yes. And, and complete, for me, it 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 was such a positive in the long run. Yes. Everything that happened, you know, was such a positive in the long run for helping me grow as an individual. Yes. So, um, Yeah, we always tell good. people when my brother went out for the football team, he couldn't believe it was such a big school that the coach wasn't even a teacher. Like he was just the football coach. Like we just couldn't believe it. You know, it was just a, you're right. It's a completely different world than the small town that we had lived in, but uh, it taught us a lot of things. Yeah. It was a good thing. Now, when you got ready, you got ready to uh, go to college. Uh, I'm assuming, you know, you get to be your, to your senior junior and senior year. And uh, when I was, at that stage, and and I'm older than you are, so I'm I'm assuming it was like that w- for you as well. Our parents weren't as invested in where what happened to us next. Like we had to wow. have a little had to have a little gumption on our own to figure out where we were going to go to school. What what was going on? We with did you at, that, at that stage. We did. Yeah, my parents are just awesome. They wouldn't have cared where or if even. Uh, my parents always had r- one rule: you'll always be learning, whether or not you're in higher ed or not, you'll always be learning something. I think that's why they were so different than the normal parents. Like when I would want to take a year off because I wanted to go to South America or Florida, work at a migrant camp, they would be like, oh yeah, that would be very awesome. That'll be educational. And so I really appreciate my parents in that way. They also weren't, um, their identity was already their identity. So they weren't depending on me to make them feel special. Special, And that's something that we have really tried to carry with our kids. Like, we're going to have our own lives, so we're not trying to live anything through you. And I think that's especially poignant now. We see that with young people. But um, now, now I forgot what you asked me. The oh, question yeah, was college. Good. Like, what was your yeah. what was your plan? Oh, my plan was to be a social worker or to. I, I, the truth is, like a lot of 18-year-olds, I didn't have a plan. I wanted to go and live with a bunch of people my age and move out of the house. And so that's what I did. Now, shockingly, that first year, I actually came to Bethel and McKenzie because we were Cumberland Presbyterians, and that's where my parents had gone to college. But I was only there for a year and a half, and then I started wandering aimlessly around. The, not aimlessly. Wandering around the world, but not aimlessly. Purposefully. Yeah. Purposefully, yes, Absolutely. So you, what, uh, what was your first, what was your first break? What did you do? I went to Germany for three months. That was just a summer mission. And that's when I started speaking and they, I had, they gave me a translator and I would go to churches with this group and start speaking. And that was awesome. I loved going to Germany. And then when I came back, I did a semester, but then I went to Florida for a year and worked at a migrant camp. That was a great experience. I learned 
pretty good Spanish and learned a lot about the migrants in Florida and some of the struggles that they had and, you know, migrant workers and that kind of thing. And then that led me, I went to Columbia for uh, six months and did, uh, I, I really loved Columbia. I thought I would, I always used to come tell my parents, I think I was Latino and you somehow adopted me, but I do look like a very huge Nordic Viking woman. So they convinced me that that was not accurate, but I loved Columbia. I love the culture. I love Latin American culture. And, um, and then I came back to Denton, Texas, and during a semester of summer school at University of North Texas, I met my husband, and he was precious. <laughs> he was so cute. I had to marry him, and so that's what happened next. And then we how, how did you how did you meet? We met because his mom and I were friends, and I was taking a college algebra class that was just kicking my pants. And she said, oh, my son's really good at math. He was a summer worker. He had come to the children's home just to work for the summer, just like as a summer worker. And she said, oh, he's great at math. She said, he can help you. So he came down to where my parents' house was every night because, you know, summer school is like three hours in the morning. And so he'd have to help me every night. And we stopped talking about algebra and started talking about other things. And then he went back to MTSU, finished his last semester, and then we got married in April of the next year. Yeah. We were one of those people that we dated for five minutes and got married five minutes later. So it was great. Well, so do you think she was uh, intending that to happen? Sure. Of course fixing? she was matchmaking. Yeah, <laughs> We were good friends and she thought it would be fun for me to be in the family. So, yeah, but it was a it was a good match. Oh, that's a great story. Um, when you were working as a in, in the migrant camp in in Florida, yeah. was that through a, like an official agency or did yeah. you just? Well, go yeah, in it was. Uh, no, no, <laughs> no. I don't. Okay, kids, I don't recommend this. Don't tell your parents. Hey, I've got a thumb. I'm going to head to Florida and work at a migrant camp because your parents are not going to be supportive of that. Mm -hmm. No, it was through an agency, a Christian evangelical agency that worked with migrant workers. I lived with this older lady in her house because she took care of me for a year. I mean, she had a little ha a little room that had a bathroom where I stayed. And uh, so, no, it was with an agency. And they provided like Bible studies. They had a church. They did beans and rice distribution constantly. We were constantly in the migrant camps going from trailer to trailer or house to house and helping with the children, making sure they got education. It was honestly one of the best experiences of my life. Yeah. So I'm wondering, uh, just listening to you talk, if your parents' decision to move you in the eighth grade is one of the things that sort of expanded your horizon and opened your eyes to the fact that you can move around. Yeah, it probably did, but I have a great... Uh, I I have respect for both pillars and movers. My mom and dad always said there's two kinds of people, pillars and movers. My grandparents lived in the same house for 60 years. They lived right across the road from the church that they had donated land to build. I mean, they were pillars in the community. They were never going to move. And that was a good thing because they provided stability for that community. But it's also good for there to be movers or else your community will become stagnant. You have to have people who leave and come in. And so my mom and dad always said, Lisa, when you have kids, you're probably either going to have pillars or movers and there's nothing you can do about it. You need to embrace it. And I thought that was so respectful because sometimes movers are kind of haughty about pillars like, yeah, they never went anywhere. They, right. But that was good because that's the people they are and they needed to be that person. But then sometimes people who don't move say they were just wandering aimlessly. You know, they're movers. And the truth is we need both of those people. And, you know, you find people in your family who would have never left the five acres that they grew up on. And that's OK. That's who they really are. And then my mom always knew out of the four kids that she grew up with, she always knew she was going to be a mover. She said, I loved that farm. I respected my parents, but I always knew that I was going somewhere else, you know. That's fascinating. That's really enlightening. Well, now that's now my parents. You're, you're uh you have how many kids? I have two boys. We have two and, boys. And so are they movers or pillars? Uh right now, it looks like they're both pillaring right now. Now, my younger one really is a pillar. I think we've known that since he was born. He's 
I think he's going to be around. Our older one, he might move. They're only 25 and 27. They both just have, ha- they bought houses and they're both engaged. And right now it looks like they're both going to live here for a while. But we're open to the fact that at some point they might move. But yeah, we love the fact that they're here right now. It's good. Are they going to, are they going to, um, get married around the same time do you have two uh, yeah, rehearsal we have, dinners uh let me tell you we got a rehearsal dinner on friday our our baby is getting married on saturday this congratulations saturday. Yeah. thank you thank that's, you that's very nice so yeah um, somewhere along the way you had the idea you started speaking and and you had the idea to e- expand on that first of all what was your major uh i majored in i went to school for six years and didn't graduate Scott. So I I always joke whenever I speak places, sometimes the person in front of me has a PhD and I'll stand up and say, oh, now let me tell you, I'll just go ahead and shoot straight with you. I went to four different institutions of higher learning for more than six years. And at the end of that six years, none of those institutions believed that my name and their name should be on the same piece of paper. (laughs) So I didn't graduate. I got married. I was not interested in school, which is the great irony because now I speak at universities and for school districts. I speak for hospital groups. And I've never, ever lied about having a college degree, because the reason people hire me is because what I give is mammal wisdom. I'm not coming in with something that I researched in a lab. Uh, It's mammal wisdom about how to get along with people, how to uh, have a more pleasing work environment. And those things either work or they don't work. I feel like I'm a plumber. If, if If I have a great personality and I have a lot of education, but I can't get your toilet to un- be unclogged, then I'm not a very good plumber. And that's the way I feel as a speaker. If I can come in and get the job done and be entertaining and helpful to your group, then that means I'm a good speaker. Now, if I have a PhD, but I can't do that, then I'm not going to have a good career as a speaker. And so it's worked out that somehow, uh, as we used to say, a blind squirrel finds an acre never now and then. And somehow I've gotten in a career that you would think would require at least some graduate school. So let's back up to the genesis of that. Um, right. What, what were the what were the steps that that the early um, uh, attempts and maybe failures and successes and and talk about the beginnings of this particular career that you're in? Okay. First of all, I didn't even know it was a career. Twenty five years ago, uh, somebody needed somebody to come and speak at their event. They said, "We want somebody who's funny." Lisa, I think you're funny. Would you come and do it? I thought it was just a hobby. Um, So I came and having no idea that that group would then tell other groups. And so pretty soon I would come home. We were broke and living in a trailer park. My husband was getting his Ph.D. We had two little kids at home. And uh, we always say we were broke, but we were happy as can be. And our kids love that trailer park. And we did, too. That's a whole nother podcast. We lived there six years. But I would come home and I'd say, Philip, you won't believe it. He said, what? I said, they gave me like thirty dollars for gas money. He said, wow, honey, this, you know, we couldn't believe it. And so I didn't even know it was a job. And so we always say it's like being a country singer. We probably lost money for five years. We probably broke even for five years. And then at about 10 years, something happened. Um, I got involved with the corporate group uh, because Dr. Suzanne Metzger slid off the road in Indiana and couldn't make it to an event in Illinois. And they brought me in at the very last minute, 500 women in the audience. And at the end, those women stood, I stood up and I first when I got there, I said, my name's not Dr. Metzger. I didn't even graduate from college. But at the end of the event, they stood, they cheered, and the corporate representative came up and said, your life is getting ready to change. And that is when it changed. And that would have been about 12, 14 years ago, probably. And I started going all around the country with a corporate hospital group. And then, of course, when you go to Tucson, there's people in the audience who their husband works for Aetna and they work for so-and-so. And I have never spent one dollar on advertising. And I've prayerfully tried not to be a very much of a self-promoter. And yet word of mouth is how speaking works. It's really the only way speaking works. So 
So, so I'm somebody who has to occasionally speak at things and I always feel super awkward and you sure. know, I always try to do as good a job as I can. And I always wonder, did I do okay? Can you give me just a few little tips on, uh, on, on getting, uh, information across to big audiences like that, but in a fun way? Well, I always tell people, be exactly who you are. I had a friend call from Jackson one time, and she was really a precious gal, super smart, super beautiful, super educated. And she said, Lisa, I know you're funny. She said, I've got to do this event. And she said, you got to give me some jokes because you're supposed to start out funny. I said, oh, girl, no, no, no. I said, you do not see me teaching algebra or modeling swimsuits. You do not need to try to be funny. And so I always tell people, be exactly who you are. I told her, look, you're smart. You're insightful. Stand up and be that but don't try to be loud and funny like me because it won't work just like if I stood up and tried to be a straight man and just be you know insightful about certain things or or act like I know things I don't know that would be ridiculous so I always just say be yourself if you're loud and funny be loud and funny if you're not do not say did you hear the one about (laughs) because I always tell people funny people never tell jokes Funny people tell real stories. They don't tell things they read on the internet. And you don't pay people to come to your event and tell internet jokes. <laughs> so I'm sure I've heard you speak. Scott, you're great. You don't well, need to oh, look very at much. you. I appreciate look at that. You. Um, so um, for folks who haven't ever gotten to hear you speak, we're going to pop in a little clip here so they can oh, kind of no. get a sense for what your, uh, what your um, oratory sounds like. Because... Because when you think of a motivational speaker, you think of a real successful, accomplished person who goes out and does so many successful things, and then they stand on a stage and say, girl, if you do what I do, you can come with me and go where I go and live the life I live. But that's not at all what I do. I go around the country telling people how messed up I am, and when they leave, they say, Clara, I don't feel so bad about myself, do you? And that's the motivator. The motivator is you're probably not like me. That should motivate you. In fact, I have a great story. A gal from Dallas called me one time and she said, Miss Smart, we're interested in you coming and doing a women's event for us. She said, every year in Dallas, we have this big women's gala. And I was feeling all excited. And she said, and every year we get someone really smart and educated. And this year we're going a completely different direction. (laughs) And when she realized what she said, she started backtracking and feeling apologetic. And I was sitting in my orange house coat out in the middle of nowhere where I live. and, And I was laughing and I said, oh no, 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 do not apologize. I'm just so glad that when you realized you wanted a stupid speaker, I'm the first person you thought of. <laughs> right there. So that's, so that's really great. So t- tell me, what, what kind of groups are you speaking to these days and delivering that, that great presentation? Uh, businesses, schools, um, uh, the, the event in Wichita was called women walking with God. That was a Christian event. Most of what I do now is in the secular market, but that was a Christian event for women. Uh, but yeah, it really, the things I talk about really apply across the board. And like my favorite, one of my favorite events, I guess, is when a school district says, Lisa, come in, we're going to have everybody who works for our school district there. We're going to have our bus drivers, our janitors, teachers, superintendent, everybody in the middle, because I love to talk about the fact that every team member is valuable and what they provide and um, try to encourage them. So, uh, yeah, uh, it, it can, it really, there really isn't a certain kind of, I got in with Farm Bureau a few weeks ago. I went to Florida and spoke to a national Farm Bureau event. And then now I'm going to, New Mexico Farm Bureau, Kentucky Farm Bureau. There's so just, yeah, I don't guess there's a certain kind of market maybe. So um, um, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, I want to ask you about your writing. Um, And then I'm also curious about your self-promotion. So I'm going to ask you a little bit about that. Oh, yeah. (laughs) 
The Real Foot National Wildlife Refuge was established about 15 miles southwest of Discovery Park to manage the upper third of Real Foot Lake as a refuge for migratory birds. There, you'll find a wintering ground for waterfowl and bald eagles. They host multiple activities throughout the spring, summer, and fall, including the annual youth fishing rodeo, junior ranger camp, various workshops, archery programs, guided canoe trips, eagle tours, and more. For their complete schedule, Google Real Foot National Wildlife Refuge. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a very positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Lisa Smart, who is a uh, professional speaker. Um, I, you probably don't use the word comedian because I don't see it anywhere, but you are very funny um, and also writer. And so I want to ask you a little bit about the writing. Um, I know you were doing, do you still do your news? paper column? No, I did that for 12 years. And then I, I just felt like I was ready to move past that. I mean, not, not move past it as in like, oh yeah, get beyond it. I just, I felt like I had d- done my time. And so, yeah, I, yeah, I did that for 12 years. I wrote a weekly column, but. Uh, and so, so you started writing in that and then, and then I know you've, you and I actually met on a panel talking yes. about self-publishing. So talk to us a little bit about your publishing journey. Yes. Okay, Scott, I'm going to warn you because, you know, I'm a people person. Only writers like to talk about writing. People people usually like, oh, let's listen to the two writers talk about writing. Uh, no, they're probably not very interested, so I'll go fast. I just got <laughs> uh, – you're either a writer or you're not. And when I was in third grade, the thing I loved best is when the teacher would say, we're going to write a story. And I would be like, whew, I was so glad to get off that math page. And so I love to write stories, and so that's how I started the fiction story about Doug and Carly and she works at a dollar general and it's just a small town Southern story. And so that's how I got started on that. And then discovered the world of self-publishing. I did have an agent for a while, uh, but wasn't making any headway. And so as you and I talked about on the panel, got involved in self-publishing. So people who love to read small town Southern stories, you know, they like Doug and Carly, but if you don't like to read, I'm, you know, like I said, so as part of part of self-publishing is and part of actually ev- everything you do um, is using um, all the tools that uh, we have today to promote yourself and your work and get your work right. out there. But that makes you uncomfortable. I listened to your video uh, where you were talking about that a little bit. And you and I also both kind of came up around the time all this stuff was brand new and we were all trying to figure it out. You know, what, right. what are your thoughts on uh, promoting your work on on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram? And I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's a monster that has to be fed like constantly. So what's right. your thoughts on that? OK, let me tell you, the first thing is I'm not critical of anybody who's out there hustling and doing it, because I think your personality is your personality. And some of these type, of, it's funny, the conference I just spoke at in Wichita, one of the other keynote speakers was a basketball coach, Sherry Cole. She was a Oklahoma girl, women's basketball, you know, famous coach up there in that area. And she is a type A go get it person, you know, just a butt biter. I bet if she, and she had a book and boy, she just knows how to hit it. And I'm not critical of anybody in any kind of promotion that they're doing for their products. But again, you have to be the person you are. And I'm just not comfortable doing that. Now, some people might say, well, yeah, it's easy for you to say because you go to these big events and after you speak, people want to buy the book. And that is true. It is true that it's easier to sell book if you're a speaker, because that's just natural promotion. Even if you don't even mention the book from the stage, after you speak and you're standing out at the book table, people are more likely to buy the book. Uh, Again, be the person you are. If you're a good promoter, if you want to hire a marketer, get out there and hustle. That is not what I'm interested in doing right now. So I'm, I'm living my authentic self, Scott. I'm being my authentic self. Oh my gosh! I mean, that that sounds like a blessing to me. Um, just trying <laughs> to con- just trying to constantly get you know get stuff yes. posted, and I mean, it's just I'm sort of that way too. I've I've started slacking on some of the social media channels because it's just so much. Right, right, and it feels like freedom when you say, you know what, maybe maybe I don't 
you know, I don't, I, it's not that I don't care. Don't hear me say I don't care. I, I love the writing and I love the characters and everything. I, it, but I can't care more about it than I do about the people that are in my life for real. And so I need to do what the next thing is I need to do. Well, and sometimes it's mow the lawn, you know, or yeah. as we were talking yeah. earlier, yeah. you know, yeah. so much to get done. I know, yeah. um, Alexis, who's, who got who got you scheduled and everything, uh, said, oh, you know, by the way, if you're using her website, um, her uh, children are now adults. Yeah, uh, I'm 10 years not, older than the website, yeah. And and her dog died. So, <laughs> so I was oh, like, I've had oh. dogs, cats, goats, everything has <laughs> yeah. died since that website. People will say, so you're 51. And I said, oh, no, I'm going to be shooting 60 this year. And they're like, oh. And I said, oh, yeah, you're on my website. Haven't updated that. I don't know how. And so I would say, well, you could hire it. Right, you're right. I could write a check to hire somebody to do it, but I'm so... I'm so done. The same reason, Scott, you're causing revelation to come to me. The same reason I didn't graduate from college is the same reason that website's 10 years old, but people are still writing a check, so I guess it's working. Right, right. And and by the way, you and I are, the, I also turned 60 this year, so you and I you are the do. same. You do? Yeah, so we're oh, the same age. 1963 great. is when I was Yes. Born. Go. June. When's your birthday? September. Okay. I'll be 60, the big 6-0. Yeah, me too. So, are, do you have any big plans for the big six zero? No, I haven't thought about it. I I don't know. What? I, no, have you been thinking about it? Yes, I'm. What are you I'm, getting ready in, to do? I'm are bringing all cruise? my family, my my uh, immediate family together, right. and and my daughter's gonna make a cake, and we're gonna um, hang out together. But yeah, it's. I was cool. planning to try to go on a trip, but yeah. the time's gotten away from me. So we're just gonna have something at home. But I'm really excited about the big so six zero. Me too. I'm not scared at all about aging. I don't want to go backwards. I want to go forward because the older I get, I get a little bit wiser. I certainly don't want to go back to when I didn't have as much wisdom. I, I want to go forward. And you and I are both at the, you know, I have two daughters, uh, 23 and 26, 24 oh. and 26, something like that. And so uh, same kind of thing. I mean, I am just right around the corner from being a granddaddy. No, you. no, no pregnancies oh. yet. Not even any marriages, but I know oh, it's, okay. it's got to yeah. be right around the corner, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we never know. No pressure, girls. That's now, girls, right. Daddy didn't mean anything by it. Yeah, Don't nope. just go to Cadillacs tonight and take the first person that comes up to the bar. Right, exactly. Cadillacs. That's a that's a Martin thing. Right? That's right. For those of you that are listening from out of town, please uh, understand the local reference. That's a that's a Martin dive bar, maybe. Yes, maybe. Yeah, yeah I've I've not been there, but that's what I hear. Um, so so what is uh what is next for you? I don't know, Scott. So tell me what to do next. <laughs> do you have any <laughs> ideas? No. I mean, I've got a I've got a wedding on Saturday, Scott. That's what's next, and then the next week I've got some schools in Kentucky, and I'm going to different places to speak, and so, you know. It, it, the good the good thing about my job is the, here's what's so cool about it. I don't have to decide what's next because people will decide for me. Oh. And I don't have to decide when I'm going to retire because one day the phone will just stop ringing. And that's when I'll realize that I'm past my prime. And that'll be OK. I don't feel any sadness about that. Now, are you people are you writing? Me. Are you writing at all right now? Uh, no, not the way I should be. I mean, I'm writing notes of encouragement to people, but no, I'm not doing any serious writing right now because I'm still, see, this is the middle of my busy spring speaking. I'm still speaking right now, but, um, if I'm, you know, if I go through a time where I'm not speaking as much, I may start writing again. Now I know some folks have been listening who've been like, I want to check out her work. I want to, I want to hear her speak. Um, and I know you're not updating your website very much. Is there Absolutely. a place people can go to find your books or your uh, schedule? Well, all my books are on Amazon, but there's also a Lisa Smart, S-M-A-R-T-T -T, on there who writes new age books about what people say as they die. That is not me. Uh, my books are, I have four fiction books the, in the Doug and Carly series, and then I have two books called The Smart View. They're compilations of newspaper columns. So those are on Amazon, or they can go on my Facebook, Lisa Smart. S-M-A-R-T-T, -T, or you can go on my 10-year-old website and send me an email. You, if you send me an email on lisasmart.com, I will write back to you, invite you to come sit on my porch if I'm in town. Um, so people can contact me for real. 
And yeah, I mean, if you just Google Lisa Smart Tennessee, all your all your stuff shows up. Oh, does um, it? Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, that's so cool. I'm now going to be hiring Scott Williams to be my <laughs> PR guy. I didn't know that, Scott. That's so interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, there's another Lisa Smart in addition to the one you yes. mentioned. And so when I was researching, I just searched Lisa Smart Tennessee, and boom, there you go. You show up. Well, so that's thank good. You for- <laughs> Yeah. I, you know what? I'm actually, when I retire from here, I'm going to come just to help be your assistant and just update your that Facebook page for you. would be I'll, wonderful. I'll volunteer in exchange for life uh, advice. Oh, for life counsel. Scott, yes. come sit in the recliner, do a little marketing, and then not. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's, what I, that's yeah. what I tell my kids. I'm like, hey, come on. I'm your life coach. I'm not meddling. <laughs> So that's what I need. Hey, isn't that, it's, I tell you the thing about having adult kids, and I know you got to go, but this is the coolest thing about having adult kids. Philip and I have learned the power of restraint. And it's a lot, isn't it, Scott? It's very difficult. Like I said, we practice it even. Like if one of our kids says, hey, guess what? We're going to sell everything we have and move to San Diego and live in a tent. It's like, well... We will be praying for y'all. The Lord bless y'all on that. I mean, you just have to practice saying, yeah, well, okay. I mean, my kids are awesome that we love them. They're just doing everything really well, we think. But it is hard to have adult kids because you really have to keep your mouth shut. Oh, 100%. I would say I probably am good at that maybe 80 75% of the time. So, yeah, no. You, <laughs> it may be strength. harder with girls because, you know, you feel like, oh, daddy's a little girl. I still have to tell you something. Yeah, restraint is hard when it comes to things like tire tread and oil changes and <gasps> oh, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. So, but, yeah. but I'm, I'm doing better, I hope. Um, I would say maybe they're listening, but they don't listen. They don't want to listen to my <laughs> Well, my boys aren't listening either. <laughs> no. Let's yeah, have they therapy. don't care. They don't care no, what you're doing. No, they don't care. No, they're out there living awesome. their lives. Well, thank you so much for joining us for a few minutes today. This was really fun. Thank you, Scott. It was a joy. Thanks to all you listeners who've uh, joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Mm-hmm.